All right, we move from the Cold War in Asia uh, to the Cold War in other parts of the world. Fighting for the Third World. The Third World nations were located in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. They were economically poor and politically unstable. This was largely due to a long history of colonialism, which we've talked about throughout the year. They also suffered from ethnic conflicts and lack of technology and education. Each needed a political and economic system around which to build its society. Soviet-style communism and U.S.-style free market democracy were, at the time, the two main choices. Cold War strategies. The United States, the Soviet Union, and in some cases China, used a variety of techniques to gain influence in the Third World. They backed wars of revolution, liberation, and counter-revolution. The United States and Soviet intelligence agencies, the CIA and the KGB, engaged in various covert or secret activities ranging from spying to assassination attempts. The United States also gave military aid, built schools, set up programs to combat poverty, and sent volunteer workers to many developing nations. The Soviets offered military and technical assistance, mainly to India and Egypt. So the next part of the world we want to look at is Cuba. So you can, can you look at this map and find Cuba? We'll zoom in and there it is just off the southern coast of Florida. After World War II, rapid industrialization, population growth, and a gap between rich and poor led Latin American countries to ask for aid from both superpowers, oftentimes playing the United States and the Soviet Union off each other. At the same time, many of these countries had very unstable governments. They may have started out as democracies, but quickly turned into military dictatorships. After the World War II, after World War II, communism and nationalistic feelings inspired revolutionary movements as well. They received Soviet support. In response, the United States provided military and economic assistance to anti-communist dictators. Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution In the 1950s, Cuba was ruled by an unpopular dictator, Fulgencio Batista, who had U.S. support. Cuban resentment Cuban resentment led to a popular revolution, which overthrew Batista in January 1959. A young lawyer named Fidel Castro led that revolution. At first, many people praised Castro for bringing social reforms to Cuba and improving the economy. Yet Castro was a harsh dictator. He suspended elections, jailed Cubans that were against him, or executed his opponents, and tightly controlled the press. When Castro nationalized the Cuban economy, he took over U.S.-owned sugar mills and refineries. In response, Eisenhower ordered an embargo on all trade with Cuba. Castro then turned to the Soviets for economic and military aid. In 1960, the CIA began to train anti-Castro Cuban exiles. In April of 1961, they invaded Cuba, landing at the Bay of Pigs. However, the United States did not provide the hoped-for air support for this invasion. Castro's forces easily defeated the invaders, humiliating President Kennedy and the United States. Nuclear Face-Off and the Cuban Missile Crisis The failed Bay of Pigs invasion convinced Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev 
that the, U the U.S. would not resist Soviet expansion in Latin America. So in July 1962, Khrushchev secretly began to build 42 missile sites in Cuba. In October, an American spy plane discovered the sites. President John F. Kennedy declared that, miss that missiles so close to the United States were a threat. He demanded their removal and also announced the naval blockade of Cuba to prevent the Soviets from installing more missiles. But Castro and Cuba were deeply involved. Kennedy's demand for the removal of Soviet missiles put the United States and the Soviet Union on a collision course. People around the world feared nuclear war. Fortunately, after 13 days, Khrushchev agreed to remove the missiles in return for a U.S. promise not to invade Cuba. even more direct threat to American security began to unfold on October the 14th, 1962, when American U-2 surveillance planes flying over Cuba made a discovery. It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe that the Soviets would introduce uh, nuclear-tipped missiles into Cuba uh, targeted on the eastern part of the United States. They never had moved nuclear weapons off the soil of the Soviet Union. We didn't believe they would, they did. It was my father's decision and, and his own idea. It was only one reason to show that we are great power and we will protect all our allies. And if anybody will try to fight against our allies, that will mean the beginning of the Third World War. The Cuban Missile Crisis would last for 13 days that October the president and his most trusted advisors tried to figure out how to get Khrushchev to remove the missiles from Cuba. As far as the president was concerned, this was a superpower confrontation. It was the Soviets who had put nuclear missiles in Cuba. It was the Soviets who would have to remove them. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response on the Soviet Union. The U.S. military was put on the maximum level of alert, DEFCON 2. The president ordered the Navy to mount a blockade around Cuba. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. This quarantine will be extended, if needed, to other types of cargo and carriers. For 72 hours, the world watched and waited as Soviet ships approached the quarantine line. They kept coming, they kept coming, they kept coming, they kept coming, so there were these days of incredible tension. The resolution of the Cuban Missile Millions Crisis of left Castro completely dependent uh, on the Soviet to... Union. In exchange for his support, Castro backed communist revolutions in Latin America and Africa. Soviet aid to Cuba, however, ended abruptly with the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. This loss dealt a crippling blow to the Cuban economy. Eventually, Castro loosened state control of Cuba's economy and sought better relations with other countries. Let's move to other parts of the world, the Middle East and Central Asia. So confrontations in the Middle East. Now the Middle East, as you can imagine, was valuable uh, to both the United States and the Soviet Union because it was full of countries that had oil. And oil was important to both Superpowers. Superpowers face off in Afghanistan. 
For several years following World War II, Afghanistan maintained its independence from both the neighboring Soviet Union and the United States. In the 1950s, however, Soviet influence in the country began to increase. In 1978, a communist group took control of the Afghan government. Many Afghanis felt that communist policies conflicted with their teachings of Islam. A group of Muslim rebels fought against Afghanistan's communist government. This revolt led to a Soviet invasion in 1979. The Soviets expected to prop up the, the Soviet, Soviets expected to prop up the Afghan communists and quickly withdraw. Instead, just like the United States in Vietnam, the Soviets found themselves stuck. And like the Viet Cong in Vietnam, rebel forces outmaneuvered a military superpower. Supplied with American weapons, the Afghan rebels, called the Mujahideen, or holy warriors, fought on. The United States had armed the rebels because they considered the Soviet invasion a threat to Middle Eastern oil supplies. President Jimmy Carter warned the Soviets against any attempt to control the Persian Gulf. To protest the invasion, he stopped U.S. grain shipments to the Soviet Union and ordered the U.S. boycott of the 1980 Moscow Olympics. In the 1980s, a new Soviet president, Mikhail Gorbachev, acknowledged the war's devastating costs. He withdrew all Soviet troops by 1989. By then, internal unrest and economic problems were tearing apart the Soviet Union itself. And it's worth mentioning that the Mujahideen that the United States supported against the Soviet Union in the 1980s, much later in the 2000s, became the Taliban, uh, for which we were fighting in Afghanistan for their support of al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. So very interesting how as we move from the 1980s into the 2000s, the sides change. And those, group, those people that we supported against the Soviets in the Cold War end up fighting against us as we get into the 2000s. In Geneva today, after more than seven years of war, an agreement on Afghanistan. The United States, the Soviet Union, Pakistan, and the Afghan government signed a piece of paper which is really a face-saving way for the Soviets to withdraw their troops from Afghanistan. There is no guarantee that it will actually lead to peace. ABC's Rick Indefirth is in Geneva to cover the signing. The UN-sponsored accord took six years to negotiate, 17 minutes to sign. The United States and the Soviet Union will serve as guarantors of the agreement, hence the presence today of Secretary of State Schultz and Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze. The accord calls for the withdrawal of Soviet troops in nine months, beginning May 15th, the return of the nearly five million Afghan refugees displaced by the war, and a pledge of non-interference in Afghanistan's internal affairs. The stage has now been set for the Afghan people to determine their own future free of Soviet forces. We welcome the signing of the Geneva agreements because they put an end to outside interference in Afghanistan's affairs. Despite these statements, today's agreement is not expected to end the fighting in Afghanistan. Indeed, there is no provision in the accord calling for a ceasefire between the warring parties. The Afghan resistance fighters, or Mujahideen, refused to take part in the UN talks vowing to overthrow the communist regime in Kabul. Moreover, both the United States and the Soviet Union have said they will continue supplying military aid to their respective allies in the conflict if the uh, other side does so. Today's agreement uh, cannot, therefore, be labeled a peace treaty for Afghanistan. But with Soviet troops now formally time. committed to leaving, the necessary first...